There's that coon right here. Brent, I'm gonna see if I can get that thing out of this hole. Let him come out, I got a hole in the Here he comes, buddy. Oh, he's gonna go up, oh no. Oh, he's right here. You see him? Yeah. All right, coon wins. Coon wins tonight. This wind, I think, is gonna make it a little bit hard today. Yeah, it could make it. It could be challenging. I've heard them say that February, the the full moon in February, is called the hunger moon because all the critters are holed up and everything is kind of stressed out. Not much food. They're waiting around for spring. There's less squirrels than there's been all year long. Yeah. Bear Newcomb hunted these dogs three days ago. Treed 12 times, never saw a squirrel. Den trees. Den trees. So our challenge is gonna be den trees, but lucky for us, my friend, we have some real squirrel dogs. Hey, yeah, that's good. Maybe. February is when you find out if you got a good tree dog, squirrel dog or coon dog. I'm hunting with my good buddy Brent Reeves in his native habitat in the White River lowlands of Arkansas. I live in this state, but in the highlands, the mountains, for me, hunting down here is like being on a different planet. Flat country, lots of water, big muddy rivers, and more game than we have where I'm from. We're hunting for three days, and in the daytime, we'll chase squirrels with my feists. But when the sun goes down, we'll be cutting loose a pair of walker coon hounds. And I've got a big decision to make on whether I want to take one of them home with me. You know, for squirrel hunting, Really what you need, aside from the dogs, which is everything, is you need a tracking collar. You just gotta have one. This keeps your dogs safe. You know where they're at. You can call them to you. You can go to them if they're treed. This is just a, a GPS collar and a tracking system. And then you just need a good gun and you're good. The levees of these big rivers are brilliant feats of engineering a relatively new invention of man that protects cities and croplands from the river's ancient flood cycle. Inside the levee, it can still flood, so you can't build or plant much, and these areas have become wildlife meccas. We'll be hunting inside the levee of the White River. So when did you start as a deputy sheriff? 1992. And then what did you do after that? Well, How long were you deputy sheriff? Well, for about 15 years, I guess. Then I, I graduated working for state law enforcement during that time in there. And both of those, at one point or another, 16 years of it over the last 32 were undercover. Undercover narcotics. Mm hmm I still work in law enforcement. I work, I'm assigned to a, a federal agency now. And, but I'm getting close to retirement. And, you worked well, on a SWAT team too? I did, I did that for about 11 years. I was a SWAT team commander. It was, it was fun and exciting, but I did all that and I'm, I like this a whole lot better. These dogs are feists, which is a broad yeah, category of dog with go. multiple let's specific go. feist breeds inside of it. The dogs are typically less than 18 inches at the shoulder, intelligent, under 30 pounds, and love to tree squirrels. Squirrels have an amazing ability to hide, even in trees without leaves. Some percentage of squirrels run when the dogs show up, and some Bye lock down and hide. Keep shaking. I'm you shooting up there to see if I can spook the squirrel loose from his hiding spot. He, there might be a hole in the crotch of that tree. Look at this. Fresh cut acorns. You can see where he's been gnawing on it right there. Talk to him, good.
Hey, he's coming down. I can't shoot, he's coming straight down to you. Woo! We got a squirt. That's a good one. All right, that's a, it's a start. You know, I think I'm, I find the most pride when, after the first squirrel. Saddle him up. Let's go get another. As the afternoon passes by, we head back to camp and meet our friend Randall Whitmore. He's the son of Mr. Dick Whitmore, who started this camp back in the 1990s. We've been staying here for a couple of years and already feel like the camp's history is our own. Some of the hunting camps on the big rivers of the southern U.S. are legendary. Duck and deer camps are common, but a camp built around coon hunting, that's unique. So, Randall, your dad bought this place in the early 90s? Yes, mid-90s. Mid and he was a coon hunter. Oh, man, big time. That's what, he, he did that more. He <laughs> yeah. loved that more than duck he, hunting, more than deer hunting. Oh, yeah, but he was also the kind of guy that he wanted to get out there and coon hunt as long as he could and get in early enough that he'd get up and go duck hunting the next morning, too. <laughs> he was I mean, it different. was no it was no relaxing around Dick That's Whitmore. And, <laughs> and, but this camp that you're letting us stay in, your dad had this, I mean, he's got kennels out here. There's pictures of him and his dogs. I mean, this was a coon hunting camp for him. It was, it was. And uh, that was his primary focus. Duck hunting was second, but he loved them, you know, both. Um, you know, he was the kind of guy that he was gonna have the right equipment no matter what. And he was probably gonna have three of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He hunted, he hunted walkers. There's this picture that was over there. That's uh, That was one of his best dogs? That was one of his best dogs. That was him in 1966 in Crump, Tennessee. That was a big hunt. Well, he, he was like ambassador to coon hunting for people all over the world, for really for the United States, because there was folks coming, like you said, from everywhere. And I have yet, in my short time in coon hunting, you know, on social media or whatever, run into somebody's, oh, Mr. Whitmore's place. Mm. Every, and they know it. I mean, he's... Mm -hmm. He's up they there, man. Him. Yeah, absolutely. He always said to keep a good dog, you had to hunt when, even if you didn't want to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, you had to go when you didn't want to and you had to keep them conditioned. So, mm -hmm. And that's what he was all about. From the time he could, he was in the woods until, I mean, until he got sick. And every bit of his experience is, I mean, learned in the woods. And my grandfather never hunted. So it was all self-taught. Yeah. I mean, he got yeah. out and you know, so his opinion you, was based on facts and stuff that he'd seen with his eyes and done. Absolutely. Everything learned in the woods. And he was a true, I mean, he was a true houndsman. Yeah. yeah. He always hunted walkers. Always walkers. I've had blue ticks and plot hounds and mm -hmm. intentionally stayed away from walkers. But I'm looking at one to potentially buy that we're going to hunt for the first time tonight. <laughs> Late winter, deer season's over, duck yeah. season's over. This is like the greatest day of my life. <laughs> you get to do it all. The squirrel hunting, coon hunting, and I, I got to see this new dog go. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I think you're gonna like it. You fixed to get a taste of what real coon hunting is. With a walker? <laughs> That's right. I've never, so I've never experienced coon hunting because I've never hunted a walker. I get it. All, all right, right. Well, let's see. Let's see how it goes. Let's get in, let's go. I'm a plot hound man to the bone, but my good female Fern passed away last winter. I'm hurting for a good dog, and Brent's got me convinced that I need to hunt this walker on trial. This is kind of like test driving a truck before you buy it. This dog's name is Rocker. He's three years old and is basically a finished, fully trained hound. It's a weird feeling turning out a dog that I didn't raise. This is a fine hound. And what I haven't told you is that walker hounds dominate the coon hound world. For every 10 walkers, 
there's probably one of every other breed of dog combined. What we've just done is we've free cast these dogs. These dogs are trained to only bark at the scent of a coon. And, and there's a lot of training that goes so they don't run deer, they don't run possums, they don't run skunks. But these dogs, they'll go out there and the coons have already come out of the trees and have been feeding on the ground. Dogs are looking for that scent, they're gonna bark. They're gonna start to trail that coon. The coon's gonna hear a dog coming and either gonna run a little bit or just go up a tree. The dogs, these are tree dogs, which means when they when the scent of the game that they're after goes up a tree, they stay at the base of the tree and bark, and that's a special dog, because not all dogs are gonna do that. That's what coon hunting is, is that these dogs are specialized dogs, and at one time, a coon dog was a super valuable thing because coon hides are worth so much money. Yeah. You can make more money if you had a good coon dog than if you worked at the sawmill when, when minimum wage in the 1970s was $3 an hour, yeah. which is true. And so these dogs developed an incredible cultural value in a lot of where there were coons. Good boy. Well, that's pretty good for the first drop. Just a few minutes after cutting loose Brent's dog Waylon and my walker on trial, they get treed. We see the coon hunkered down in a small hole in the tree. Using my voice, I squall like a coon in distress to try to get him to come out of the hole. Let him get out, let him get out, let him come out. Okay, there you go. It works. Go. It's a good sized coon, good, good hide. I've always thought a coon was just absolutely beautiful. Yep. Look at that. Man. Look at the fur on this. He's got a good, that's got a good hide. That's not bad for a dog on trial. First drop. Man, when a dog is really intense on the tree, like that dog was, running up and down the tree and barking. I mean, that's really what you want in a dog. I mean, just for no good reason other than just it's fun to watch him get that excited and intense. Some of the areas we were hunting yesterday and did so good in, the White River is coming up fast. We're hunting what these flatlanders down here call a ridge. Anywhere that's not wet is a ridge. We're going into the hardwood timber, I'm going to find a squirrel. Number one inside of the truck. Where's he at? Number two, it's better than number one. You catch them, I'll string them. The way I like to skin these squirrels, I call it the Batesville method, is you take a pair of snips and you snip off all four feet. Snip off the tail. Snip off the head. So now I got a squirrel with no head, no tail, no feet, and then I'm gonna just nip the skin all the way around its midsection. So now I got the squirrel with a ring around it, and then you just put your fingers under the skin, pull off, pull off the top. Then we got a totally skinned squirrel and put your clippers in, run it all the way up the, the rib cage, rake out all the goodies, and then 
about a minute and a half, two minutes, you got a skin squirrel. As the evening approaches, it's time to put the walker on trial to test again. It looked really good last night, but I'm still not sure if I can do this or not. It's our second night of coon hunting, no wind, probably 35 degrees, fantastic conditions. I, they couldn't be better. And so we treed three last night. This rocker dog looked real good. We're gonna cut them loose again, and I'm kind of hoping he makes a mistake. <laughs> Let's go. You got rocker treed right here, whaling's treed right here. You can see where he followed his feed track around, and he went treed here. And he's made circles. <laughs> There he is right there. And he's way up there. Yeah, he's a pretty good He piece. slam dunked that coon, man. This is like now a total of like an hour and a half maybe that I've cut loose this dog. And he's treed four coons and just is a very hard tree dog. I mean, I've never owned a dog that treed that hard. So he's looking real good. Real good. All right, fire in the hole. Sure don't look as pretty when they're wet. But it doesn't matter. He did a good job, the dog did. <laughs> yep. Ring tail. Good boy, good boy, good boy, good boy, good boy. Now I, what I always carry with me is some hay string, Brent. Yep. Carry it with me. Everywhere I go, because if you don't have it, you're in trouble. Some people use dog leads, but it's hard. It's harder. So you wrap them around. Just go ahead and tie a good hard knot in it because it's just hay string, so you can just cut it. And then, now what we need before we get going here, a couple of green sticks, about as big as your ring finger. Oh, for the tail? Uh-huh. And then once it's about, so I've got about three inches of that tail there get these sticks right here. Grab that tail, because you'll pull that tail off. It comes right off. And then you got your, you got your tail that is ready. Pull it down. Just cut it around. Cut his ears and eyes and mouth out without tearing it up. Boom. Beautiful coon hide. That's a pretty good hide for Arkansas hide. Yeah. Fur is still good. If it wasn't wet, it would look really pretty. It's our last afternoon. We finally got this good weather. Mm, it's good. It's perfect. 65 degrees. No wind. Let's go, let's go. Let's go kid. So when we turn these dogs loose, we are, these dogs are hunting for us. So they're not just blowing out through there and we're chasing them. And when you coon hunt, that's what you do. You just turn loose the dog and you pretty much go wherever he goes. When you're squirrel hunting, we're letting these dogs get out about 150 to 200 yards. You don't want them to get much past 200 yards because if they tree, it's hard to get to them quick enough before the squirrel gets in a hole. Where's he at, Tess? Keep 
when we're squirrel hunting with dogs, I like to have a shotgun man and a 22 man. Ideally, you shoot one with a 22 so it doesn't mess up the meat. I could care less what they, what shoots them. I just want them to fall out of the tree and I want them in, in the bag. Yeah. All those 22 purest squirrel hunters out there can go crawl in a den tree. I can deal with pellets. Your granddaddy's philosophy doesn't fly around here. Man, now I know I'm really hurting some people's feelings. Tess and Tim, we call Tim Tebow, their jobs are complete. It's time for the walkers' final shift on a coon hunt. dog is worthy to be bought, but I gotta talk to my wife and I'm gonna take it back up in the mountains and hunting. Well, that's a good, that's a good thing to do. That's why it's a dog on trial. It did good down here. Treat some coons, beautiful dog, good dog. So I'm gonna see if, I'm gonna see if Misty will let me buy him. Let's go home. It's time to reap the reward of our labors. Fried squirrel with all the fixings. It's time to eat. I'm just gonna take these cleaned and washed squirrels, and cut them into quarters. What we're doing to make these squirrels tender is we're gonna parboil them, which means let them simmer for about 12 to 15 minutes. Sometimes you might just pan fry them and they might be tender like a chicken wing and then the next one tastes like a rubber tire. And so when you parboil them, it, it starts a, it gives, gives them a head start on the cooking process, and makes them tender. So we're gonna parboil and then pan fry. What's a cat head biscuit? It's all reference to size. You want, the old saying is, Biscuits, big, the good ones are the size of a cat's head. And that's that's what we're going for. Yeah. We're gonna mix that up. Oh yeah. It is good. Yeah. That's tender as any chicken leg you'll ever get. Mm-hmm. When I deer or bear hunt, the stakes and difficulty level are so high it can be a stressful grind. And I do love that. However, squirrel and coon hunting with good friends is a sheer joy. It's a pleasure hunt, a social time, a light moment in the midst of a sometimes stressful life end it with a good meal and it's hard to beat. And being in this big river country is something special. And for Rocker, he is a fine hound, more than worthy to ride in my truck. But I decided to let him pass. So I'm still in the market for a replacement for my old plot hound Fern, which is gonna be tough. What a great hunt.